mechanisms that are that are also involved that come from outside the head. It's not only a, uh, something that happens inside the head. So when we usually think of migraine, when the general population think of migraine, the first thing that comes to mind is, is headache, um, which is fair enough because it's sometimes it's the most bothersome symptom uh, and it's the, fa the most famous one, let's say. However, sometimes headache is is not only what migraine is made of. And basically, headache might not even be the symptom that keeps us more, more disabled. So I'm going to ask you to go to uh, Slido again to answer the new question. This is the new question. So is what is the most bothersome symptom apart from the headache? Yeah, we have aura there, nausea, fatigue, light sensitivity, disorientation, vomiting, dizziness, brain fog and nausea, weakness, more vertigo, pain in the neck, tiredness. We have a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting, a lot of dizziness there as well. Vertigo, feeling achy, irritability, loss of speech. Can think straight, visual disturbances, more fatigue, low mood. And this is so far also 39 people. Okay, so more or less, we have a, a wide variety of symptoms. Okay. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Can you see the PowerPoint back? Yes. Yeah, we can. So this is the headache symptom, uh, the main one. Then it's associated with what it is called canonical symptoms, which is uh, what is described in the international classification as the main symptoms accompanying the headache. We have nausea, which is one of the ones that has been uh, more uh, more clicked. Then we have movement sensitivity. Some people have said tiredness, fatigue. Then we have aura. People have uh, mentioned uh, speech problems, weakness, um, visual disturbances, sensitivity to light, and sensitivity to sound. Those are the ones that are included in the in the classification and are usually the most famous ones. But actually, if we if we think of everything that everyone has written, it looks uh, a bit more like this. Uh, the vertigo problems, the dizziness, uh, gastric problems, the mood changes, and all these other things that can sometimes be a little bit uh, disabling. And they are all uh, connected together. Uh, so sometimes one symptom precedes the other, and they can be before, during, or, or after the headache. Then the first symptom that we are going to talk about, and I'm not going to talk about all of them because that uh, is a lot of time. So I'm going to focus on the ones that can actually be treated. The first one is nausea. It's the one that I've seen uh, that was uh, precisely more, um, one of the most prevalent ones. And this is um, a very easy picture in, in which we can see uh, people who were in the, in the lighter colors are the people who have, uh, who have the, more impacted uh, presentation of their migraine. And if you can see the ones on the right hand side are the ones who have nausea uh, half of the time of, or more. So that means the more nausea you have, the more disabled you're going to have and the more impact you're going to have because of your migraine. And nausea is a symptom that is very easily treated. This is just a Google picture of the some of the antiemetics that are available around the world. Uh, those antiemetics can can act in very different systems and they are very different medication and it's not the, the best one. Uh, we just need to find out which one is the best for which patient. Then the second symptom I'm going to talk about is, is dizziness. It's another one that has been one of all the most uh, prevalent ones. And dizziness can present in very different uh, ways. 
So around the world, um, apart from migraine, dizziness is a very prevalent condition. A lot of people have it. And out of 10 regular people that you can find off the streets, four of them are going to present dizziness frequently. And among that, those four, one person is going to be particularly disabled because of that dizziness. Uh, I want you to pay attention to that woman, the woman in red, because it's going to come up afterwards in the presentation. Then if we go back to the classification, um, uh, we look for uh, dizziness or vestibular symptoms in the, in the classification of migraine, of headaches. Um, we have to actually look for that. Uh, because it's not in the normal classification, it's in the very bottom, in the appendix, uh, alongside with other things that have not been um, particularly broadly described. Uh, and th that is where we can find vestibular migraine. Then if we go even deeper in the small print of the classification, we go to the, um, to the, uh, to the appendix where they uh, describe what vestibular migraine is. Um, we can see, first of all, that Previously, it was named in very different ways, migraine-associated vertigo, uh, migraine vertigo, migraine-related vestibulopathy, which was not very helpful because we had a lot of patients having more or less the same symptoms, but they didn't have the same diagnosis. And then the diagnostic criteria, um, it need, you need five episodes of that, a current or past history of migraine, and vestibular symptoms that last for between five minutes and 72 hours. Then half of those episodes are associated with migraine symptoms uh, like headache, photophobia, phonophobia, or visual aura. Now, some, some of you may think, yeah, I'm, I think I might have vestibular migraine. Uh, and some of you may say, no, I don't fulfill the criteria. But then we go um, even deeper in the small print. And there are several things that are not very well defined. We are going to see them uh, one after one. The first one is what what we consider vestibular symptoms. Um, they describe them, uh, dividing them into different symptoms. The ones that happen spontaneously, so nothing actually trigger uh, your vertigo. You were just sitting down and suddenly you start having vertigo or start feeling dizzy. And those are uh, described between uh, internal and external vertigo, depending on if you think that everything is moving around you or if you think that you are the person that is moving. And then vertigo that is triggered by something. And trigger means um, after a change of position, for example, you're sitting down or standing up. A ver vertigo that is induced by something moving around you or induced by motion of your head, turning your head. And I've included a couple of um, examples of this later. Then the duration of the symptoms is very variable. It's not actually what it says in the main classification. About 30% of people uh, describe symptoms of minutes, hours, or days. But then that we have another people that describe symptoms that are only for seconds or symptoms that uh, last for actually weeks, especially the people who have chronic symptoms. And then we have a, a couple of examples of um, situations uh, where people experience the vertigo. The first one is, for example, you turn your, your head quickly. Another example is a sensation that everything is spinning around you or sensation that is yourself, the one that is spinning. And the other example, uh, weird sensations like uh, being about to fall into a hole or sensation that you're either in an ele elevator or a lift going up or down. And then um, visually induced sensations. So um, uh, being on the train, for example, uh, triggers your dizziness when you see the images moving around you. And the other one, is this, this one is described very frequently, a sensation of being like a uh, rocking or the sensation of being on, on a boat. Uh, precisely the, the last one, uh, this is one example that we can see in one of the trials, um, the sensation of being on a boat, some, experience, some patients experience that in the way of sway. And you can actually see that the person is moving, even though they are trying to be completely still. And when this is measured in a proper sway platform, uh, what is seen is that patients that have migraine, particular types of migraine, migraine with aura or chronic migraine, uh, they can have a even uh, an even even more a, a prominent uh, movement during this during this uh, test. Then the timing of the episode when these uh, episodes can happen, 
is also variable. Uh, one symptom is enough during one uh, during one of the migraine attacks. So if you have a migraine that lasts for three days, and during that migraine you have this sensation that you turn your head, and and you get a bit dizzy, that could be considered a vestibular symptom. And then different symptoms can happen during different episodes. So in one migraine, you might have the sensation that you're stepping into a hole. And then in the next one, you might have the sensation that uh, everything is spinning around you or that you feel that you are rocking. And uh, it's the same. And then they, they can happen before, during, or after the headache. Uh, some patients actually comment that they notice that the headache is about to come because they can feel uh, everything is spinning or the other way around. They know that the headache is about to finish uh, because um, because things are moving a bit more quickly. Then other causes have to be ruled out be before considering that this is just a vestibular migraine. So especially in patients who are particularly disabled, um, they should have a, a proper medical history and a physical exam to make sure that these are not other types of conditions. Uh, aura. Uh, would be one of them. We have some patients that experience aura that involves uh, symptoms of vertigo. Then another uh, condition is BPPV, there's benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, which has nothing to do with the brain, but with the inner ear. It's a problem of uh, crystals that move in the inner ear where they shouldn't be. And the problem with BPPV is actually Patients with BPPV have more migraine and patients with migraine have more BPPV. So these two things have always, uh, always need to be taken into account. Another condition is Meniere's disease, which is a problem in the, in the liquid inside the ear. And that should also be ruled out, especially patients that have uh, problems like tinnitus or problems like hearing loss. And then the last uh, thing is triple PD, uh, positional perceptual uh, dizziness. Uh, and this is what has been called uh, also functional dizziness. So functional dizziness <clears throat> is a bit of a, a, a disaster of a, of a classification because many things could be considered functional. And functional basically means that we have done all the tests and we can't see anything in the structure that is, uh, that is uh, dysfunctioning. Uh, so it's probably the way that the, the parts function that is not going well. It's described as a disruption between the visual and the postural control mechanisms uh, involving the perception of where you are um, situated in, on the floor, your visual inputs, um, your, the inputs or where you are located in the space, both your head and your body, and how the brain integrates all the inputs. Then. Um, it, it can usually be triggered after an incomplete recovery following an, an actual uh, condition that causes you to be dizzy, like a labyrinthitis, like an episode of vestibular migraine, other medical conditions where there is some metabolic uh, alterations, uh, a, a problem when there was a very extreme psychological distress or after accidents like head trauma or traffic accidents. And then there are some psychological factors that can uh, worsen the functional dizziness, like uh, certain personalities with, that are more anxious than others, being a bit depressed or being a bit more uh, vigilant of your body sensations. But then actually, if you have a migraine, you're already quite vigilant of all your sensations because the, your threshold for everything that's happening around you is, is a little bit lower. no? And... Um, the fact that these patients with functional dizziness respond to some antidepressants that are actually migraine preventives, then it makes you think a little bit uh, if this was actually a vestibular migraine or not, uh, and which one was first, uh, the chicken or, or the egg, no? Then um, the age of onset can vary. And if you can see those two distributions, in the top row, we have uh, the males in black and the females in white. The males don't have any particular distribution and the females follow what, what they could be considered a bell curve. So during the reproductive years, they can feel a little bit more dizzy. The top row is patients that were um, in the clinic just because of headache. And then in the bottom row is patients that went in the clinic because of the dizziness who also have a headache. And then in those patients, uh, those are the female ones, if you remember the, the woman in red. 
And that can happen after the uh, between the 40s and the 60s, which if we think hormonally, then we can see that patients that are very disabled with dizziness can be around the perimenstrual period. Then the other symptom is motion sickness. Uh, another example of how patients with vestibular migraine have the perception of motion. So this is a test in which the patients were put in a, in a chair and they move the chair slightly to the left or to the right. And this is the threshold um, that the patient, um, the patient realized if the chair was actually moving or not. Patient with vestibular migraine has a very low threshold, even minimum movements could make you feel, feel that you are being moved whereas the healthy controls needed a bigger movement uh, to notice. And then things are connected with each other. Uh, so in this graph, for example, uh, patients were, <clears throat> were given some cutaneous stimuli uh, after being in this chair when they make them feel dizzy. So the ones that actually developed a lot of nausea felt more dizzy and felt more sensitive to the skin. And that's another example of how all the symptoms can be related with each other. These are, it's a comparison, a basic comparison. We have the two columns. The first one, patients with vestibular migraine, uh, with motion sickness, sorry, and in, in the other column, patients without motion sickness. And the patient on the left, they have all the other sensitivities, sensitivity to loud, to light, to sound, to smells, everything was higher than the patients that didn't have the motion sickness, which can also be treated. So when we think of the treatment, the first thing that we need to, to ask to ourselves is uh, what are we already taking? That is the first question. So I'm going to ask you to go back to the slide though. And we're going to do the last question, which is, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, it's activated, I think. How many days per week do you need painkillers? I think we can see them now. Okay, we have 48 replies so far. 49. So we have some people who need a lot of, of these painkillers. The majority is once or twice a week. Then there is a, the lucky ones that is rarely. Some other people every day. And three, four days a week. We have about 25% that need painkillers a lot. Then another more or less 25 that needs them three to four days a week. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Okay, are we back in the slides? All good? Yeah, we're back, yeah. Yeah. So the first thing to do when we have a look at our medication is to, is to look at our painkillers. This is a picture of uh, the sumatriptan that you can buy on over the counter. And if you have a look at the side effects, obviously, we find a lot of things. One of them is dizziness. You can see there also tiredness, drowsiness. Um, these side effects sometimes are because of, it's the side effect of the drug, but sometimes it's because of something that happens that I'm going to try to, to explain the, the same way that I explain to my patients. So this is our brain, literally the, the smartest part of the body, no? 
and our body knows how to keep healthy. So the brain is constantly working in a lot of very complex mechanisms to create a cocktail of what we could call natural painkillers. So all of us have already heard about the endorphins and other things like that. And those natural painkillers usually keep the threshold for pain uh, quite high. So then everything is fine. Uh, however, one day we have a headache and then the, the threshold for everything goes low. The threshold for pain, threshold for stimuli, the threshold for uh, the sensitivity to light. And we are feeling rubbish. And then we decide, oh, hold on, let's take a painkiller. And the brain says, oh, that's great. And the pain threshold goes back to how it was before. Brilliant. However, if this happens very frequently and we need painkiller one day, and then another day, and then another day. The brain, which is the smartest, thinks, hold on, why am I working so hard doing my own painkillers if I am receiving them from outside anyways? So the brain uh, becomes a little bit lazy and stops creating their own painkillers. Then what happens is that the threshold that was very good uh, reduces, and that threshold includes everything, includes the threshold for motion, the threshold for lights, uh, for cutaneous stimuli. This is um, an example of how the brain of people who take uh, painkillers very regularly behaves differently. So you can see the waves on the left. Uh, on the top is the person who is healthy, doesn't take any painkillers. And in the bottom is uh, uh, the brain of people who need painkillers every day. Then the treatment is is quite a complex thing uh, because obviously every person is different. Uh, every person has different comorbidities. Uh, the way that we react to medication is different as well. Uh, but essentially we can divide the treatment between acute and preventive. Acute is what we treat uh, the attack with. And the, there are some tricks to be able to keep a good at, uh, acute treatment. One of the tricks is to try to uh, treat it early, as early as possible, so that the rest of the symptoms don't fully develop. And then is to uh, combine uh, the medication that you need, because sometimes maybe taking, uh, for example, an aproxen is not enough, but if you take an aproxen uh, along with a sumatriptan, it might be uh, more effective. And then, as we were mentioning before, treating nausea, because if you're taking uh, a couple of naproxens, uh, asomatriptan, but your stomach is not feeling well, the medication is not going to be absorbed because your, your stomach is not working properly. So we have to treat first the nausea to be able to uh, get the medication actually absorbed and, and be effective. And then we have a whole range of preventive actions that we can take. The first action is to try to av avoid overusing painkillers. And overusing is actually a bad word, it's a misnamer, because if you read the VNF, if you take a paracetamol every day, you're not overusing. But your brain doesn't know about the VNF. It knows that you're giving them the medication from outside, so he doesn't have to work. So to avoid the brain from becoming lazy, we will need to use the painkillers only when you have the attack and try to do a, a, what we call painkiller holidays so that the brain don't get used to them. Then. If, if the migraine is very disabling, obviously we need a preventive treatment and the preventive can be also individualized depending on, on what are the, the main problems. Um, it can be individualized by a GP, by a neurologist or by a headache specialist, depending on, on the person. So then the take home message, um, it would be that the, the symptoms associated with migraine are very varied and they can change during the life, especially in women, and especially related with hormonal changes. And the first step in the treatment is to review the painkillers, um, that all the symptoms are interrelated and we need to actually treat them, the ones that can actually be treated, especially the nausea. And the last one is to ask for help in case that you need it, uh, because uh, we are here happy to help, obviously. Then thank you 